Hello, I'm Wesley and this is my channel 22 Zines. Today I'm going to be doing a deep dive on one of my favorite tarot decks, the Bohemian Animal Tarot. Um, for me, a deep dive is just going to be taking a good look at the symbolism in each card of the deck and the imagery of each card. Um, it's going to be sort of like a walkthrough, but a lot more focused on my personal thoughts and associations of the symbols present in each card, and what I notice about the cards, what I like or dislike about each image, that sort of thing. So a little more intuitive, I guess, dive on each individual card. I really want to do this series as a way... Oh, and this will be a series, by the way. I want to do it as a way to get my, to know my decks more closely. And I also hope that it will be helpful for you if you have this deck or if it's been on your wish list and you're sort of struggling to connect with it. Um, or if you just want a different perspective to spice up your interpretations or whatever. Or just want to see what I love about my decks. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Um, I'm going to split these videos up into majors and minors just to make them a little easier to manage because otherwise we're just going to be sitting here forever. Um, the videos will all be going up at the same time, so right after you're finished with this Majors video, you'll be able to watch them together, go straight to the Minors, um, if you feel like marathoning the whole deck. I will also have chapters going to each card if you want to go to a particular one, or if it came up in a reading for you and want to hear my thoughts on it, that sort of thing. Uh, so let's just get into it here. So all the cards are in order and ready right now. These are the backs. Um... And it seems funny that I'd even have anything to say about the backs, but I do, because as you'll see as we get into this, the fox is the um, representation that they chose for the magician, and the rabbit is the representation they chose for the high priestess. And I really like how they've had this interaction on the backs, because I feel like it speaks a lot to the combination of two sides of the self, sort of the unity of opposites, um, where if you see the magician as a sort of creative, energetic force, and the high priestess as sort of a um, an intuitive depth force, it's sort of like the the breadth versus depth. Um, you have the predator versus prey here, and it just works really well as a unity. Um, so I really I really love these backs. And they're gilded on the side, which is nice, too. All right. So the first card is the Innocent, which is what they um, what they renamed the Fool in this. What I really like about this Fool card, for one, I like that they chose a fox, because we normally associate foxes with being very witty and cunning and intelligent um, and you might not immediately want to uh, give the fool that much credit. <laughs> I don't know how else to say that but um, you might initially think that it would it wouldn't be appropriate for the fool but what I really like about that is that it's showing you don't have to give up your wit. You don't have to give up your mind and you can engage in this sort of fool energy or this this fool behavior of, you know, wandering and leaping before you look and all that sort of thing while still being a rational, cunning, intelligent being. And for me that's that's really important because engaging with a more um, esoteric and mystical side of myself is something that I'm really working on and it's it's been difficult for me. What else I like in this is that this big bag looks like a big strawberry <laughs> and I I really like that because it says two things. It says that he's bringing something important. You can see it's very full, the bag. It's just stuffed with things. So he's bringing a lot of things, but they're all very important, and they are nourishing to him in a way. 
it is the food of the soul. And <laughs> like you could say that he's carrying the past experiences that he's actually learned from already, which is a little weird for the fool because you think of the fool as being sort of null, you know, no experience. But, you know, if you think of the major arcana as being a sort of cyclical journey, then he's bringing all of the experiences that he's had from the from the previous journey. And that's what it is for us. We aren't born the fool and remain the fool only as babies and then, you know, end up at the world right before we die. <laughs> you know, it's... We... We keep coming back as the fool, and we don't have to give up previous parts of ourselves for that. So that's what really stands out to me about this card. The next card is the High Priest, or the Magician. Um, we have our Fox Friend returning, and what first catches my eye about this is that the magician is not alone. The magician has a lot of little creatures that are all meant to represent different elements. You have a salamander here to represent the fire element. You have the owl for air. You have the frog for uh, water and the squirrel for earth, presumably. You also have this little gnome here. <laughs> I'm not sure if he's an element thing or if it's supposed to be more of spirit and a more human um, thing. I'm not sure, but uh, what I like about that is that I think the magician is usually depicted alone because we have this idea of personal power and the personal ability to create and a sort of personal mastery over the elements that the magician has. And you can see it that way because you see he is the anthropomorphic um, fox, you know. He he is the one who's more human-like out of them, and um, we often think of humans as being more intelligent or, or more conscious, I suppose you would say. Um, but I think that you it also speaks to the fact that you are never creating from nothing. You are never entirely alone. You have the support of the elements and of other creatures and of other other people or gnomes or whatever. Um, so I guess that I that's why I like this depiction quite a bit. I also like how the star uh, repeats itself. The star beams. You have the um, the star up here, which. I sort of see as the North Star or a guiding star because it's the only one there. Here the beam repeats itself as the wand, and I really like that idea because it's basically the light is being used, it's being captured and used as a creative tool and a creative force. Um, so it's a bit more actively um, energetic. I think that's interesting. And then here you have the squirrel who is holding this little beam as though it's an acorn or something that it's eating. And if you think of acorns and seeds, it's about um, potential and it's about planting something for growth in the future. And that is what I really like because it's not just about, you know, it's, um, the magician is not just about creating, it's also about getting that sort of spark to keep you going. If you think of the fool before the magician, at some point the fool is going to wake up. I guess I see it as that, where at some point it's going to be too much, the challenges are going to be too difficult for the fool, and that is when you need a more uh, intentional, resolute force, a spark or something to keep pushing when things get hard. I don't see the fool as someone who likes perseverance. I see them as someone who is a wanderer. Um, anyway, so that's what I really like about this one. Here we have the High Priestess. 
Um, <laughs> and the High Priestess is a rabbit. What I really like about this, and the thing that always draws my attention first, is this moon in the background, how it has a little rabbit figure in the moon. Because the whole idea of faces in the moon, and the man in the moon, and even like, uh, with the sort of classic Halloween silhouette of witches flying across the moon, you know what I mean? I, I feel like those all speak to the idea of things being hidden in the shadows and hidden messages and um, being able to look and see things anywhere. Because that's the thing, is that the moon itself is not does not actually contain any of these things, you know, and it doesn't, um, the moon is a reflection of things and the, the man in the moon or faces in the moon, I feel like it's not like it, how am I trying to say this? It's sort of like speaking to this, this ability of humans to craft stories and to gain wisdom out of anything where we see a bunch of craters on the moon and we are able to humanize that. I mean, that is, that is insane. And that is how we, that is how we evolved. And that is, that is central to our core survival. And that's what I really, that's what I really like about this. Is it, um, it really shows how, depth and being able to find meaning in things is vastly important in our lives and is something that we are not only really good at but we were really meant to do as a species. That's one of my long rant things that I could go on about forever. Um, I don't want this to take a billion years. Uh, so real quick, before I go to the next one, the other thing I really like about this card that, again, always catches my attention is that the bottom of this robe has the infinity symbol. I forgot the esoteric name for it, but it has the infinity symbol that's embroidered along the bottom, um, which to me speaks a lot to the idea of an infinite well of knowledge that's just below the surface, and it's reachable and it's findable, um, but it's not present, you know, it's not here on the, on the hood. It's not here on the, on the bodice. It's, you know, hidden. It's probably not something that you're going to see right away when you look at this card. Next, we have the Empress or the Goddess in this deck. Um, <laughs> I think this one's kind of a goofy card, but in a nice way. Um, because I feel like this is taking, again, that that creative energy and that creative force and um, commanding it in a more intentional way and in a more um, directed way. Where the magician, I sort of see as almost like creating just for the sake of creating and um, not very grounded, whereas the... Empress, I feel like, is a lot more intentional about what they are creating. If that makes any sense. Like, this <laughs> this bee, this honeybee, is creating honey and is using their power, using her power, to command these worker bees and to um, sort of, to control them. And it's not necessarily in an aggressive way. It's just, it's almost like through her sheer presence, then these worker bees are motivated to go out and collect um, nectar and collect pollen so that they can make honey. Um, which, I hope that makes sense, that it's, it just feels like a little bit more of a practically creative force. I also like how over here you have this waterfall and you have these mountain peaks and it's getting a little more rocky on this side because I feel like that, um, I just always like it when the Empress is sort of inclusive of 
um, barren aspects to. I guess that's weird, but it's sort of like, you can see that she is coming out of this barren landscape. You know, she is, she is leaving it and she is, um, heading towards this, this creation in this spring. I suppose it feels more like this is not her entire world of this green verdant wonderland. You know, everybody's world will always include portions that are rockier <laughs> and more barren and, um, and that's okay. And you can and will move past that. So I like that a lot. Next we have the god, who is the emperor. I really like this depiction, and this card comes up for me a lot in, um, in daily pulls especially. Um, what I really like about this, and what I think is sort of the whole of the card, is that it's about a sort of balance and unity of opposites, where um, I feel like that speaks very well to a balanced and just ruler or a balanced and just father figure, as many people often see the emperor. Um, and you can see that in a lot of ways, where you have the blue and the red robes that then combine to make the purple robe, which is also a color of spiritual enlightenment, and that is uh, closest to their head and closest to their heart. And you also have the honeybee here that's referring to the goddess in the previous image, which is really nice. Um, the, uh, okay, more on balance. I was about to move away from that. You have, of course, the night and the dark. You have the land and the sea. You have, um, again, you have a sort of predator prey thing because you have the spider web over here. And then you have a prey animal here. Um, and I just, I just feel like that's really important to, to think of the, think of strength and think of personal power and think of us, this authoritative stance in a balanced way. Um, like one thing that you can see here is that this elk Ooh. is holding the world in a very gentle way. It's not a tight grip of refusing to let go of something. It is a confident, supportive, sturdy, gentle kind of grasp on things and gentle. So this idea of like a gentle support, um, a combination of the um, rigid force of supporting and the more um, fluid force of of gentleness and and of adaptability. I, yeah, I really like this depiction. Here we have the shaman or the hierophant. Um, this is a heron, uh, which is a water bird, and you can see the herons in the background here. You also have a mantis and a cat. There's a lot going on. Um, Seabirds in general and water birds in general, I feel like are, are waiters, <laughs> both waiters in that they get their feet wet, but waiters in that they stand and they wait and they watch. And there's this sort of patience that is involved with, uh, you know, with fishers. What, Cause when you're going fishing, <laughs> you need a lot of patience and you, um, you have that sort of relaxation of the, of the ocean and this, so I like the selection of Heron for this. I think that it speaks very well to the patience. Um, you have the eye of Horus here, you have a spiral, you have the triple moon, you have a lot of these, um, esoteric symbols, which of course they all have their own individual meanings, but sort of collectively the idea of having esoteric symbols inscribed in the walls. They are literally set in stone. You have this time-honored knowledge and this time-honored tradition that 
the heron can share and is doing so in a very patient way. Um, and it's almost like saying that the heron's patience is what enabled them to gain this knowledge. Um, patience in, in learning from others in order to become a teacher. I'm probably going to have to do a lot of cuts in this. Sorry, just because I'm, I can be sort of a slow talker when I'm trying to pick out exactly what words I want. I'll try to trim that out. Anyway, I feel like this one's pretty straightforward, but it's still a very good representation. Here we have the lovers, um, and this is a pair of partridges, which is so <laughs> cute. Partridges, they mate for life. You have an enduring choice, where once they've made their choice, then it endures and they are going all in and it and it lasts for a very long time which i i like about that i mean i think i think this is a sweet card i don't know that it especially has a lot to say on the lovers card um like on the concept of the lovers but you know i do i do think that the choice of animals was really good in this case Here we have the carousel, and these are capuchin monkeys and um, carousel horses. And <laughs> this is such a fun card, and of course it reminds me of that scene in the uh, Disney rendition of Mary Poppins where the Banks children are riding the carousel horses, and then they come to life, and then they take those carousel horses and they run in a horse race. You have them riding the horses and it's in a very directed sense, in the sense that they are the ones riding, they are the ones in control in some sense, but it's so fantastical that it's not something that you could ever plan on happening, your carousel horses coming to life. And so there's this sense of of wonder and and excitement about, wow, look what happened. I can go wherever I want to. I can do whatever I want to. You know, suddenly becoming a commander of magic in a way, of a, you know, a driver of magical horses. It's, um, it's really got that exciting, exuberant energy of really, um, I think, I just think it captures the idea of really feeling capable of taking the reins and of um of just expressing yourself in a way and of do of doing whatever you want to do this is one of my favorite renditions one of my favorite cards in the deck it is the strength card or the warrior um <laughs> and i have to point out that they are in a library i am a librarian i have always believed in this idea of of knowledge as power and of knowledge as being where true strength comes from and knowing things about the world and knowing things about yourself and about other people's experiences and all of these things is where strength comes from and where you can draw strength in many ways at least for me you know that is that is how i <laughs> how i relate to my personal strength i feel like is um is in it's through knowledge and exploration in a lot of ways um here you have the traditional strength card in the back which was done as a painting i guess by this presumably by this badger um you have the badger is lifting this selection of heavy books as though it is a dumbbell like you know li <laughs> lifting it up and down in a way and um i mean that's a sort of literal rendition of flexing your knowledge right <laughs> um you have this very interesting fey 
person. I don't know how else to describe it. It's sort of like, you know, it looks like some, some person with red hair and two deer horns. Um, and what I really like about that is, um, it's about, it's sort of about the integration again of mystical and, um, for some spiritual concepts in addition to worldly knowledge. Um, in fact, I think the, let's see, what's the title of this book? It is Animal Dreaming. Um, so I guess it does, it speaks both to outer strength of what you can gain from other things and other, um, books and other worldly things and inner strength, things that you can understand from your own dreams and from your own, um, intuition and your own mystical side and magical side which, isn't that just so perfect for a tarot reader <laughs> to see that? I I really like this one. Here you have the Hermit or the Solitary. Um, what I like about this Hermit is that these steps are implied to be never-ending in a way. Where there is no ultimate enlightenment necessarily and the bear seems to know that they are not even looking at the steps they are not looking up here where the steps lead they are using the steps as a tool to get a top-down view of what they already know and that I really like because it feels very much like taking time out for reflection and what reflection is, is reflecting on things that you have already experienced and things that you already know um, to get a new perspective on them. I really like that. And I also like this idea that um, of these steps because it's sort of like knowledge and wisdom really comes one step at a time. And again, it's not something that has an end goal. It's something that you can perpetually walk towards and you can you can direct yourself towards but no one is ever complete and no journey is ever complete until it's complete you know <laughs> um so anyway i really like the stones in this one i think that says a lot about um how the hermit actually works in a way Here we have the Wheel of Fortune, or here it's the Wheel of Fate. Um, this one, I, I like it. <laughs> I think it's cute. I think it's sweet. It, you have a family of pigs that are clearly, um, li they're living out of this wagon, and so they're, they're sort of letting themselves be dictated by fate. They are not trying to hold on to something like to establish some sort of stable housing st stability anything like that in the material world because um they have such an understanding that it's always temporary and you're never going to be able to get complete stability that way and so instead they derive their sense of stability and their sense of happiness from their family and from each other which I, that is the enduring part of this image. And that's what I really like about it. It's everything else can change, but they'll always love each other, I suppose, is the, is the ultimate meaning of it. And I also always really like when the Wheel of Fortune is a very happy card because I think people who have had have grown up with a lot of difficulties like I have or just who otherwise have have had a lot of bad situations there's this sort of underlying fear that it will never improve that that you'll just be stuck on these bad cycles and that's what I like about the wheel of fortune card in general is it's sort of a reminder that um this too shall pass what's that adage it's like what it's the answer to a riddle what can you say that will make a wealthy man happy and a poor or sorry a wealthy man sad and a poor man happy 
or something like that. And it is this too shall pass. Um, so I really like that one. This is the justice card, which here is called consequences. Um, you have this spider, uh, fortune teller, <laughs> the spider fortune teller who has lured this fly into the tent. Um, <laughs> this one's just, I, I really, it's so goofy. Um, but it's really meaningful too. Um, you still have the classic symbols of the scales and the sword and all that. Um, I really love the multiple eyes on this very human-like spider. It's really, you know, many of these are the, the, um, human body and animal head, and this one seems to be an animal body and a human head, which I don't know that I have much to say on that. I just think it's interesting. Um, you have all of these eyes that are, I guess it's pretty obvious, but you have this idea of like a clear sight. But what's interesting is that you can see the fly has very big eyes. And if you think of how a fly sees, they have the sort of hexagonal um, surfaces to their eyes and see many pictures all at once in a way. And this, this depiction, you know, is this is a front facing eyes for a predator, right? And so you have these, um, it's almost like they're, they're all staring straight ahead. And so you get this idea of a real sense of clarity of, you know, she can still see multiple things. She can see in multiple directions and she can see more than the average human, I suppose you would say, but she is so focused that she knows what is important to look at, which is you, <laughs> you, the, the tarot reader, not the fly. And that's what's so funny. It's like, you'd think that, um, you'd think that she'd be interested more in looking at this fly and trying to capture the fly in her web. And by the way, this card that the, uh, fly is holding is the death card from this deck, which is hilarious. <laughs> Anyway, I just think that's interesting as sort of an, um, an idea of cutting to the important part, cutting to the truth, cutting to the heart of the matter, and all of that just from her eyes, you know? I just, it's really interesting. Okay, here we have the suspended man, or the hanged man, a bat, very appropriate, and that's been used on multiple other decks. You have the white horse and the black horse, which is reminiscent of, I mean, basically every black and white duality. You have the chariot, you have the um, columns in the high priestess. You've, you know, it shows up all the time in tarot. Um, but here it's a nice reminder as sort of existing between worlds. And a bat, in a way, also exists between worlds. It, um, It's a mammal, but it flies, and it exists primarily in the air. And it exists in our world, but it sees things upside down when it's resting. And it's, I guess the bat is just a very appropriate animal to choose for taking this moment out and seeing things from a different perspective. It is this animal that, that exists outside of our usual boundaries, I guess, of what it means to be a mammal or what it means to be a bird or what it means to be um, to be anything, um, what it means to see things clearly, what it means to relax. It's, you know, it's just, it's, it's a good, a good selection. Okay. This death card, it's a lot. And, and I know that, um, I think it's a lot in a good way. <laughs> Let's try to break it down here. You have the, uh, the figure is death with a, uh, I believe it's a vulture, um, skull instead of a feathered, <laughs> alive vulture, and it's holding the plague doctor mask, and it's dressed up in the plague doctor getup. And here, 
Um, you have a lot of animals. I didn't actually realize this really until I read the guidebook. You have a lot of animals that are um, usually associated as being bringers of disease. You have rats, you have mice, and you have ticks. And you also have these other dangerous, you know, what we would cons what we as humans often consider to be dangerous animals. You have the snake and you have the crocodile. Um, and that is really interesting because you would almost think that death should be the one who's actually bringing death. And there's this tendency to externalize the, um, the job of the actual killing to death. But this depiction of death is actually meant to be a healer of death. You know, it's a very scary visage, but that's what plague doctors were. They were doctors, and they were trying to heal these things. And there isn't a scythe here. It's just, it's just a stick. Um, I'm not sure if it's meant to be something specific, but it is, it's definitely not a killing instrument. Um, so the real death in this card is inherent in um, the other figures. You know, the rats are are going to die and that's just sort of how it works and you can you know i know that rats actually i don't know are rats affected by the plague themselves that's a good question but either way um we associate the plague as being with with these animals with the rats and with the ticks and with um you know the other animals so that is it's just interesting. It feels like we carry death within us, and then the purpose of the Reaper, or the purpose of death, this death figure, is actually to bring about the rebirth process, um, or bring about healing from death. And you can see here that these two dead figures are quite happy with each other. I assume this is a uh, Dia de los Muertos reference here, <laughs> where, you know, they're... They seem, they seem quite pleased in the afterlife, and so you can sort of think of it as, well, when these creatures die, then the purpose of death is to, is to direct them towards this happiness, or to remind them in a, in a way that, um, that death of the old is what leads to this happiness. I don't know. It's this one's still a little hard to read for me, to be honest, but it is. It's very intriguing and very striking. But it is probably nothing compared to this next one. This is the Temperance card, or Moderation, in this deck. And the first time I saw this, I was like, what the hell is this? I had no idea what it was trying to say, what it was trying to read. It was... and it's so weird. Um... And then I read the guidebook entry for it, and it completely made sense for me, and it completely changed my opinion of this card, and even what we should expect from temperance cards in general. It was that impactful. This depiction is meant to show that your purity... It, it's a mink, by the way, of the, or an, an ermine. Um, it's meant to show that your purity will not be sullied by engaging in sinful quote unquote things. I don't I don't like using that word, but you know, engage by um by letting yourself enjoy things. You know, you don't have to give up everything and become a completely um you know, chaste person in all senses of the word to be a spiritual person or to, or to, you know, be a good person or to, or to improve yourself. That's the thing, because the whole thing about tarot is about improving yourself, right? I just really like it because it means that indulgence is not a bad thing. Indulgence is just things that make you happy and things that make you human. I'm, I'm so, I really love this card. Um, what else can I say about it? The, the key phrase, I guess, is all things in moderation are good for you. And that really means 
all things. That means that you can engage in the fun aspects of things and the and the things that are rewarding of, you know, you have this mink who's engaged in, in burlesque and that is sort of a fun expression of sexuality that, um, you know, throughout which the mink is retaining her personal power. There's probably so much more I could say on this one, but I'm just going to leave it at that for now because <laughs> otherwise I'm never going to move on. This is the devil or the lower world in this deck. And this is a toad who is a puppet master. And we often think of the devil as being a puppet master sort of, um, sort of thing. Um, and I suppose I would see this, especially immediately following the previous one, the, the depiction of the previous one, you know, this one is more about, um, what happens when those things are no longer in moderation, but when you give your life over to them, where you have this woman who clearly, she, like, she seems that she could fit in with this burlesque, um, crowd, you know, and perhaps it has gotten to a point now where she is no longer empowered by it and she is no longer enjoying it. She is being controlled by it. And that is what makes it bad. And you've got this guy who seems very like a, uh, what's the word? Conquistador type thing. Um, again, it's, someone someone who maybe it was maybe it was a good thing at first this not the not the conquest part but the idea of exploration but it was through succumbing to this greed i guess of um or this this wanting to exert his power over the people native to the lands that he landed on um that is what made him bad. <laughs> you know, that is, a, that is how the devil managed to start controlling him. Um, something, something, <laughs> something like that. Here we have the tower or the rook here. Um, this one, I feel like it's pretty straightforward. It's a pretty classical rendition of it, of the tower. What's interesting about this is that you have the um, non-humanized animal who seems very comfortable up here on the tower. And in fact, I don't really know what that's about, where I wonder if that, I wonder if you could take that to mean that, and look, you have another one in here. That's weird. I wonder if you could take that as a sort of idea of it's a human made structure so it's not something that affects them and it's destruction is not something that affects them i'm going to have to think more about this one if you guys have any thoughts on on what that would mean on having the you know the two birds still remaining in the tower just let me know i'd i'd be interested to think more about that here we have the star which is a unicorn, obviously. Um, what I really like is that this uh, this card on the bodice of this dress are a bunch of zodiacal symbols, Taurus, Leo, Gemini. You have all of that integrated, which is just kind of, kind of sweet. And I guess what I like about it is that there's a sort of confidence about this unicorn. Um, it's almost like it knows that it is rare and it knows that it is fantastical and it knows that it's not a real animal. And um, it's almost allowing itself to appear before you as, as sort of a reminder to keep hoping and keep searching. It's sort of like if you imagine cryptid hunters where they are out there on Loch Ness and they are 
you know, still looking for that monster. And and people are still doing that and making these pilgrimages to Loch Ness to look for something. And just every now and then you'll get like one more little picture or one more little leak or one more little something that kind of keeps you on the path. That's what this kind of reminds me of. It's like this this unicorn who's just allowing itself to appear briefly as a flicker at where you're not even sure if you've seen it, but it's enough to keep you going. And that's what I kind of like about the star, because in general, the, you, you know, you think of the stars and they're very, they're very, they're very small. <laughs> they're just little tiny dots of light, but it's just enough to really fill you with a sense of awe and wonder that you wouldn't have otherwise. Um, I really like that. And I, I also like how it, you have this, um, some sort of, some sort of antelope. Is that like an ebex? I'm not, I can't quite tell the species or anything, but you have this, uh, this horned deer, like, you know, horned deer horse, like animal back here, which you, you could almost see that as what it actually is, where if you, this is, um, this is your hope, and this is that little glimmer that gets you to keep going, and then as soon as you're over the hump, and as soon as you keep going, you are able to find something that maybe isn't exactly your fantasy or exactly what you thought it would be, but it is real, and it is more stable again, and um, allows you to rebuild this foundation. It's sort of like when sailors used to see uh, uh, dugongs, and consider them mermaids, or that's sort of the theory, is that sailors would see a dugong and think it was a mermaid. That's sort of what I feel like of you seeing this animal and you think that it's a unicorn, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter because the point is that it gives you hope to keep going. It's just kind of interesting. Here we have the moon, which is such a beautiful depiction. This is probably the most technically brilliant animal uh, face or animal depiction in the whole deck is this wolf right here. Looks really good. Um, and I like how it's actually at night. <laughs> that's something that's always kind of bugged me about moon cards is when they take place during the day. You know, no offense, Pixie. I'm just not not <laughs> super into it. What I like about this is again, it feels like such a fantasy and such a fairy tale that it's all, it's, it's almost not real. It's this, it's, it's like a dreamland. It's like where you end up when you follow the, the rabbit hole or, or whatever. You end up in this weird topsy-turvy world where wolves are wearing clothes and dancing. And, and it's so funny because you'd think that, you know, all of these pictures have animals wearing clothes and doing human things but in this particular one just I think it's because of the environment because the environment is so empty and so natural um that it's rather surprising I guess there's no props there's no structures it's just this natural environment that has these two wolves or I suppose you could see this as a dog I kind of see it as another wolf but whatever you have you have these two canines who are <laughs> who are dancing. So I guess, I guess that's, that's pretty much what draws my attention with this one. Here you have the sun, which, um, is quickly becoming one of my favorite cards, despite my gothic exterior. Um, what I like about this is this sense of parenting and reparenting where usually the sun has just the or not usually but you know in the classic tarot art you have just the baby and here I like having the family dynamic going on the family aspect of it because to me a baby that is not supported is not a good sign you, you know if that baby doesn't have a loving a loving family, however that family may look, if that if that baby doesn't have love and support in its life, then it's not a very happy occasion. And this one, it's 
it's a happy family occasion where they're all out here dancing. I don't know what is up with this penis lemur um, in the back. Uh, so, you know, I'll have to, I guess I'll have to figure out what he means eventually. But <laughs> for now, I just like looking at the lions. Maybe it's just because they're my favorite animal. So, of course, I'm going to be obsessed with them. I guess I just get a lot more of this sense of happiness. And I get the sense of, you know... If you, if you think of the fool as the baby or the fool as this lion cub who has now grown up, who is now um, trying to make a more everlasting happiness for their cubs, you know what I mean? Of try, trying to make it, trying to bring the sun to the lives of the cubs. And it's, a, it's more active and it feels more stable and more present and... Um, more actionable, I guess, in a way where I could see my, I could see pulling this card and saying, okay, I'm gonna, I need to do, I need to be nice to myself. I need to be nice to my inner lion cub and do something that it will appreciate, like go eat a zebra or something. Anyway. Next we have Judgment. This is the first card that I ever saw of this deck and I actually used this image in my Judgment zine. <laughs> I think it's hilarious because for the first time you actually see the fool come back. But you have this the uh story, I guess, of Anubis weighing the heart against the mat feather of truth or uh I forgot what it was called, but like and that's a great story and I really love when they have Anubis involved in judgment because I just think it's such a nice um if you're going to have to depict this judgment as in seeing what you did right and wrong and trying to determine if you're a good person or, or do this very religious association with judgment, then at least doing it with Anubis, I just like it better than Christian stuff. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> what's weird, though, is that in the background here, you've got a lot going on. You've got this this black cat angel, which... I like that because usually um, black cats are associated with um, more underworld stuff. I don't necessarily mean that they're bad luck or that even in tarot that they're often associated with bad luck, but it's just, um, I guess you would expect to see a black cat as the high priestess or in the moon card or something like that. But you have these angel wings, and so you have... Um, you know, and this cat is almost beckoning <laughs> to to whom? To the fool here or to Anubis? Um, it's really interesting. You have the phoenix for rebirth holding the egg. So it's sort of a reminder. I guess that's sort of what both of them are for, is that you have this, you have this angel and you have this phoenix with the egg, and it's all sort of reminders that this is about rebirth and this is an opportunity to learn and to go back again and to um, continue trying. That this isn't the end. That just because you can now see, oh, um, my heart is heavier than the feather and so I've done something wrong or my heart is the same as the feather and so I've been great. It's sort of like either way you're still going to be moving forward. There's still more to come after this. This is just kind of a check-in. This is a, you know, this is just pointing out some things that that you need to look at. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, I like that as judgment when it's not meant to be a final judgment. Because there's no such thing as a final judgment. There's no such thing as finality. You know? <laughs> okay. Here we have Mother Earth. And I'll be honest, I, I find this card kind of goofy. It's got a werewolf in the background. <laughs> How can it not be? Um, and for the longest time, I thought that this was a lizard of some kind. But I read the guidebook recently, and it's actually meant to be a sea turtle. Just without the shell on the back. So, of course, it's a little hard to recognize. Um, but you know, you have this turtle who's standing on a turtle. So what's interesting again, is that you have, you have animals that bridge the gap between elements where you have either seagull, perhaps that's an albatross. You have, you know, water 
adjacent birds. I guess you wouldn't call them water birds, but you know what I mean. You have you have birds that you have sea birds. Um you have mermaid who's sort of half land and half sea. You have a salmon which is half freshwater and half saltwater because of their um you know run to the ocean and back. And you have this muskrat which is very associated with water. Um because that's where they make their homes. And I don't know about the werewolf, I suppose you could say it's, you know, half man, half beast, whatever. I just think it's rad. Um, yeah. (laughs) But besides that, you know, I think that speaks really well to the idea of the world. Oh, and it's called Mother Earth here. I don't think I mentioned that. I mean, you can see, but just to say it out loud. Um, So I think that's really important as an understanding of Earth and of the Earth is thinking of it as much as oceans as it is land to us and um, sort of the life-giving capacity of water and that's what the, that's what is to be celebrated and that's what um, a sort of harmony of the world is involves is sort of an integration of water and sea again it's sort of a union of opposites or a balance of opposites that comes up a lot and yeah not not sure what else to say about it but just that i like how watery this world card is there are two bonus cards in this deck for the majors i don't usually read with them So this is actually going to be my first time that I'm really looking at them. This is the universe. This is a Scarlet Ebus. And this, I guess, is a Sacred Ebus, which is the Egyptian Ebus that the god Thoth is... um, Whatever, that, that, that the god Thoth thought has the head of (laughs) whatever you want to call it and the ebus is holding this cosmic egg and that is really interesting because a lot of times we think of the universe as this vast empty place but it holds within it an infinite potential and that is what i think that's really what i think about as eggs it's and and that's really what I think the concept of of rebirth birth and rebirth is kind of about is about potential and always future potential for something for something different or for something the same or for something to be created or um transformed it's like <laughs> it's like anything could happen and anything could be in it and everything is contained within it and that, and that's very appropriate i guess for for the egg i could see the universe as an egg i really like that the last card in this deck is the afterlife and here we have a mandrill um representing god i suppose and you have these foxes um what perhaps one of them was the fool um who are now ascending i i see this as you know these these two in black died and they are ascending with the help of this angel fox (laughs) um i'm not such a big fan of this one because it feels very religious and i am not a religious person and i don't like the idea of this of a a heaven or or sort of final final place um but the inclusion of the mandrill is really interesting because they are often associated with wisdom and with um knowledge and with the sort of spiritual ascension for some reason perhaps it's the painted face or the large pink butts who knows yeah i don't have much to say on this one it is a very weird card um in general i don't like using bonus cards i like keeping to the <laughs> regular tarot structure a lot but you know it's interesting and so figured you should at least see it all right so 
I'm going to come back later to do the miners. I will uh, link the miners video in the description below. I'll probably try to go a little faster through the miners. Um, but yeah, I hope you've enjoyed so far this uh, look through the major arcana of the Bohemian Animal Tarot.